Hello and welcome to Good Morning Vibration, a format of the digital TV channel of the German-speaking issue of Forbes. My name is Andrea Glesemann, I'm senior editor, and I'm happy to start the day with you. Under the theme, the morning makes the day, diversity makes the difference, in this format, I meet a lot of different personalities, talk with them about their career, what makes them successful, and what we can learn from them. So today, it's absolutely a pleasure to welcome Ralph Edmundium. So um, he is a cybersecurity expert and best known for the ethical hacker. And for over 20 years, he had trainings on cybersecurity to companies such as IBM, Google, or Microsoft. And he even took his talent to Hollywood and has worked together with the director Oliver Stone on projects such as the movie Snowden, um, Snowden or the series Mr. Robot. So welcome. Ralph. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So let's start with an easy question. Do you have a morning habit? Morning habit. Yes, uh, my morning habit actually is first thing, unfortunately, I look at is my phone and uh, go through just emails. And, and usually I don't even end up out of bed for 10 minutes just going through emails and, and you know, just checking on what's happening in the world in one way or another. So, Ralph, you told me that you're currently in Los Angeles, and as I mentioned, you work for Hollywood. So, how did your um, Hollywood career start, and what is it exactly what do you do there? Um, so, well, I moved to Hollywood about, I guess, nine or ten years ago. And uh, originally, I started with uh, doing some work on films that have been, or music have been hacked. So, you know, big artist projects that the music got out before it was supposed to, or a film that it got out before it was supposed to. Some of the <clears throat> most notable ones was I worked on a film, Twilight. Yes, Twilight. <clears throat> um, uh, and it was basically, they had some hacking issues while it was in production. And so originally I kind of moved here to work on, on things of that nature, but it very quickly became it bled over from providing, you know, computer related security services to then also providing creative services to the directors or writers. And that's how I ended up working with Oliver Stone on Savages, uh, Snowden, and uh, Mr. Robot, and all, all the likes. Um, so it was kind of interesting to then be put in the crew side, where before I was an investigator. Um, <clears throat> so since then, I've also handled many of these type of high profile cases of somebody getting hacked and having to number one secure them but then also go after who hacked them so uh besides hollywood you um work as an ethical hacker and why did you decide hacking for good and what is ethical about it so that's a great question and uh in the sense that you know, uh, the it's a term that's kind of come up over the last, I don't know, 10 or 15 years, the, the term ethical hacker. Um, and it kind of came up because uh, early on, I used to teach hacking a lot uh, to government institutions and companies and such on, so on. That was my way that I found that I could do it without very early on, without getting in trouble was, well, what if I'm not really doing it i'm teaching it and uh the target environments the target computers are set up just for doing this as opposed to you know unlawfully hacking something um and so it was uh it was there that it sort of became uh let's call it a a career early on was by doing that and then of course the whole industry of cybersecurity. then it became an industry and a multi-billion dollar industry uh, and what we, we call it penetration testing, which is basically also another term for ethical hacking. Um, mm -hmm. It's the more technical term, which means that we're, we, you know, we are hired to go in and break into computer systems to show whether we are. Now, the ethical part comes in uh, in that, you know, I don't do it for well, anything that I feel because the word ethical is very personal, I think. Um, you can say there's corporate ethics and things of that nature, but uh, to me, as you know, you, you can't hire me to go hack someone else, right? Forbes can hire me to hack Forbes. 
that Forbes can't hire me to hack another company. And so, you know, that's what makes it legal. And at the end, you know, we're showing Forbes as an example. This is where your vulnerabilities lie. Then sort of rate them to what needs to get fixed quickly and what needs to get fixed a little down the line. So just, just managing risk, right? Uh, and then the term ethic, the ethical hacker actually was given from students um, way back when I was doing a lot of this teaching um, because those questions would come up and they try to come up with scenarios to say, would you do it then? If somebody was holding a gun to your mother's head, would you do it? You know? And so that's where the, the issue of ethics came in and, um, you know, and, and, and they were the ones that threw that word around saying, oh, so you're the ethical hacker and it stuck. Okay, now we talked about one type of hackers, I mean, the ethical hackers, and what other types are there? Well, you know, there's a term that we, we use black hats and white hats. And then I say that the, but not so jokingly, is that most people are really gray hats, right? Um, it, it comes from the, the, the terminology comes from the, day, you know, the cowboy movies. You know, the guys wearing the black hats were always the troublemakers and the ones wearing the white hats for the sheriff, right? Um, and basically that's what we refer to is that we're white hats if we're professional uh, security people in this area. Uh, black hats are more the criminal element uh, and, uh, and cyber crime, of course, is a big issue. It's also one that unlike in our world, in the professional sense of, of computer hacking, um, they don't ask for permission and they go in and then they figure out how to monetize the data after the fact. Uh, we, of course, don't go in without permission and, of course, from the, from the people who are doing it. So cybercrime is just one of them. Now you also have a lot of state-sponsored hacking, if you will, and that's really exploded over the last few years, um, especially within the media being able to cover the you know disinformation misinformation campaigns that are led mostly by um you know foreign governments of one sort or another so those are hackers too right and those are sort of gray area because it's not quite illegal if the government says you can do it right um and so you have this kind of you know black hat being cyber criminals gray being sort of in the middle between you know sometimes what i would, would some might consider a criminal or um, you know, not good things for society. And then you have the white hats, which are what make up most of the cybersecurity industry. And how professional are black hats these days? I mean, how easily can companies be hacked? They are very, they're just as, to be honest, they're just as professional. We all use the same tools and the same knowledge base. Um, so how easy? I mean, that is kind of an interesting question. Um, some companies can be very easily hacked because they really don't spend enough uh, time uh, and resources on cybersecurity. It's a real issue because most people see it as an afterthought. Um, many companies only do what they feel they have to by the law when it comes to cybersecurity. And uh, oftentimes, you know, you hear about these major hacks that happen to big companies. Uh, and these companies met all of the regulatory guidelines. They, they passed the audits and still got hacked. And uh, that is the, the big misconception is just because you pass an audit uh, or an assessment that that means that you're safe. Um, this is an ongoing issue, an ongoing effort. So you'd be surprised to how easily, if you want to use that term, hackable, some of the biggest companies that you would never think uh, would be hackable are. So, you know, among the more secure are banks. Obviously, anything that has to do with financial transactions tends to have a higher level of security. But for the most part, you know, small, medium, and sometimes very large businesses um, have a lot of wide open holes on the internet. Okay, well, that's um, a bit interesting. Um, when, it, when it comes to hacking, um, how does it work and how has it de developed over the past years? I mean, it said that hackers are now use automated tools and such things. Yeah, so I mean, it's, uh, I've been in it 
from, as a, some, from a boy, from a wee little boy, uh, actually from around 13, 14 years old, as a hobby. And what's changed, obviously technology has changed and the power of, of the devices that we use have changed considerably. You take, for instance, that, you know, your, uh, your mobile device, your iPhone or Android device has more computing power than a supercomputer did when I got started. So um, that has changed. And automation of these you know, there's tools and the development of tools that we use has certainly changed as well. There's a lot of great tools out there that make this uh, easier, I guess you could say. Um, but what hasn't changed all that much is still the, sort of the same problems uh, and the same errors, right? Because, you know, it's grown in such magnitude instead of dealing with, you know, I remember, you know, we're dealing with just a few hundred computers uh, initially on the internet. And then it, you know, it would be tens of thousands and then millions. And so the number of, re of, of devices and, and computer technology that's being used is so much greater than in reality, it has never gotten better, right? It's only gotten worse in some cases because the complexity is much greater. Um, and the sort of the, the landscape has grown more too. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting debacle because I of, often times like to also say, you know, we have to be careful with, you know, this business because we're really in the business of trust, right? Security, safety is an issue of trust. Um, and too often it's an issue of money, right? And, um, and we have to sell a company on, you need this. Cyber criminals don't need to do that. They just go in, right? So it's, uh, it, it's, it's changed a bit. And like I said, mainly the technology and the computing power and all that, but it really hasn't changed in, as far as vulnerability. We're still generally very vulnerable. So now when having a look at COVID-19, I mean, the, there's a huge increase in the digital landscape. And um, with that, there's a lot of unprotected data. So how should companies act right now to make sure that they are more protected? Well, that's a great question, because one of the things that COVID-19 has, uh, has forced is greater use of technology, right? Uh, in, in ways that we kind of were using it before. We did this before, right? Um, but we didn't do it as much. And we certainly have found to, that, you know, we have to find the ways to sort of, uh, you know, restructure how we do things. Uh, and we very quickly can do that. Um, the, the bigger problem that exists is because we're now using these platforms a, a lot more, Zoom being a good example of one that got hacked in the process of COVID, um, then the issue is, is that now you have more of a focus from the cyber criminal community um, as to the numbers are much bigger and they're also not behind a firewall anymore. Now you're working from home, you know, now I'm sitting here at home and you, a lot of us who work for, you know, any kind of corporate environments, we're using VPN, yes, to connect to work uh, or something similar. And what happens is if I get hacked as a, you know, telecommuter uh, from whatever. I was playing a video game. I was doing this, whatever. However, I end up getting hacked. Now they have access to the company too, because I'm VPN into the company. Where before, you didn't really have as much of that issue because we're all sitting behind the firewall, and if you will, behind, you know, the office environment, uh, which of course has security, certain security in place. Now we're really all on the internet, right? We're all kind of wide open. And while VPN is a security technology that is supposed to be secure, what it is is just a tunnel being created before, between here and, and, and my work, right, or my office environment. So it actually opens up more vulnerability right now uh, under this COVID crisis than what it did originally, which was to create a secure pipe into work, a secure channel into work. So we're seeing a, a, a big increase in this area of attacks just at the general population. Because like I said, cyber criminals, don't have, they figure that out after they got, they got the hacks in, right? So we're also seeing, you know, a, a, a lot more of these phishing attacks and what they call, you know, spear phishing or whale phishing, meaning targeted attacks against executives. 
Um, we recently had here in the US, we had a very large uh, law firm that actually handles a lot of entertainment clients. I think from Lady Gaga to whatever, a bunch of, of majors and the law firm was hacked. Uh, the hackers were asking for money uh, to not release all of this information. Imagine legal information about some of the biggest names in the entertainment industry. So that is just what you're hearing about because it's what's being reported. There is so much you're not hearing about because the news is so it's completely taken over by the COVID crisis. So as we come out of this into whatever the, the new will be, you're going to start hearing about some major hacks that companies have, have, have had to deal with that, that have not been reported yet. But how can an individual or a company distinguish between a fake and a, a real hack? I mean, could be that the hacker says, okay, I hacked your company and I have all that information, but maybe that's not true. How, how to be sure, okay, that is a real danger and uh, yeah. That's a great question because the truth is, is uh, some hacker can just wreak havoc with a phone call or an email saying you've been hacked. The truth is at that point, the company has to hire, you know, at, or start what's called an incident response case. And that is a very expensive thing. Uh, that's why it's one of the interesting things that people don't, companies don't spend money up front on security, but boy, if they have a hack in the house, it's going to cost them typically millions of dollars to, to go through the process of, of doing an incident response case. Um, but, and it's, it's very hard to your point about, um, how do you know, right? Like, obviously I know what I'm looking at and I'm I know what I'm looking for, but how does the regular, you know, person who's not necessarily technical know whether that email is real, whether that website they ended up at doesn't have any malicious code. They don't, the truth is they don't. I mean, the phishing attacks are one of the things you can kind of look for, but even that they've gotten really, really good at even creating context so that it sounds like the person in the email. It has the same signature as the person is coming from the same email account. All of these different things that lead you to believe that, Oh, this is an email from the CEO who's telling me to do a wire transfer uh, on a Friday at 4 PM uh, of $65,000. And uh, you'd be surprised how many people have fallen for that. So that's, what's happening more and more with, with, uh, within this COVID crisis is a lot of, like I said, the phishing attacks. Um, the only recommendation I can give you is, you know, to more than ever use common sense. Um, if it doesn't sound or look like it should, you know, something that you should be, then make a phone call. You know, we sometimes forget that these are just tools, you know, for humanity, but that we are human. So if, if you're questioning that email that came in at four o'clock about, a, you know, hurry up and do this wire transfer, call the person and say, do I really need to do this wire transfer? And you'd be surprised, you know, how many times, um, luckily somebody has caught it within minutes of somebody pressing enter on a major transaction. So it's really just use a lot of common sense and if you, and ask questions. And if you, you know, you have Google to give you lots of answers. Um, but uh, if you have any question about something, don't click on it. Uh, rather pick up the phone and do it the old fashioned way. Make sure that uh, that that is who we think you're dealing with. So thank you, Ralph. That was really insightful and really, really interesting. And when having a look at the, the time, I think we are at the end of our session. And once again, I would like to thank you for taking the time today for being here. And okay. I hope you guys out there enjoyed the session as much as I did. And since we were talking about cybersecurity, which is part of tech, I would also like to recommend you another format. At 11 a.m., our publisher, Heidi Eichinger, will talk to two ladies from WeShape Tech. That's a network uh, which aims to create um, more diversity and inclusion in tech and innovation. And they will talk about the network itself and how, why such a network is needed. And for now, thanks again, Ralph. Um, it was My absolutely pleasure. pleasure having you here. Thank, thank you for having me. Have a great one. And everybody stay safe and healthy. Yeah, thank you too. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.